So um, this is going to be a session on the new 2D graphics features, um, some of which you might have seen if you were at the keynote yesterday or watching the live stream, or you've been uh, poking around in our script or render pipeline GitHub, as I know a lot of people do, and then compare everything that happens and changes, and that's cool. Um, and a lot of the talk, I actually don't like PowerPoint that much, so most of the talk is going to be in the editor just playing around with the tools and having fun. Is that OK? Some people are like, yeah. Some people are like, no, I prefer PowerPoint, please. Make, make pretty diagrams for me. Um, so my name's Andy. Uh, I work at Unity Technologies, and I'm based here in uh, the Copenhagen office. So it's a very long commute, and I'm very jet lagged for the five minute bus ride I had uh, to get here. Um, I'm also on Twitter, as everyone is. It's just my name without a space, and I usually just share cool stuff people are making and rant about the weather and politics. So yeah, just uh, the marketing stuff. Um, okay, cool. So I've got a bunch of different things that I want to talk about today. Um, there's quite a lot of material and quite a lot of things, and I've got two projects I want to kind of dissect and sort of show you how things were set up. Um, but the main key things I'm going to cover are these. So the first one is kind of the way that with the universal render pipeline, which has kind of been rebranded from the uh, lightweight render pipeline, um, has a now a 2D renderer. And that's kind of dedicated to making purely 2D games. Um, you can render some 3D stuff in there, but it's pretty much built so that we can make some very nice performant 2D features, which fit sprite workflows um, the most. The other part I want to talk about is 2D lights. And that's uh, probably one of the most fun things to show, because there's a lot of amazing gizmos, a lot of amazing tooling and functionality with these. And there's many different types. So in the keynote, I think showed like two different types. And there's probably like seven different types. So I'm going to show you all of them and all the sliders, because uh, I really like playing with sliders. So you'll see lots of that. Uh, different settings. And also the 2D renderer's masking system. So um, the 2D renderer has added this uh, pretty amazing tool called uh, this masking layer rendering, which is kind of like the 2D equivalent of kind of, I guess, PBR masks. So whereas with PBR uh, mask maps, you'd have like, Baked AO, um, uh, Specular, and Metallic, and these values. So with, the, with this 2D render, they added a similar one. So you can isolate lights to certain layers and say, oh, this is the Fresnel mask, and this is the kind of glow mask, the silhouette mask. And I'll show you, show you some of that. It's a lot of fun. Uh, another topic is 2D shader graph. Um, if you've used shader graph before, or you're aware of shader-based uh, workflows with nodes, like Shader Forge, or I mean, every engine has a shader thingy at this point. Um, I'm just going to go over specifically um, kind of like the sprite workflow with Unity. And it's actually not that very different to if you use Shader Graph before, just a different way of outputting the shader that's then generated. And the last thing is 2D shadows, um, which got in pretty hot. So this is going to be fun for me as well as you to see how this uh, works. Um, it's going to go great. Um, so explaining sort of how the 2D shadowing system sort of works in conjunction with all these different tools. So is that OK for everyone? Uh, so Sorry, I, I moved here, and I'm still trying to learn Danish. And it, it's limited to thank you. So it's very fitting to English uh, politeness, right? Um, so there's two, two studios I want to say a massive thank you to. One is a studio called Pixel Rain. Um, I don't think they're here. If they are, we should probably chat uh, at some point. So they make this amazing game called Robbie Swift Hands and the Orba Mysteries, uh, released on tons of platforms. So they've lent us assets to be able to demonstrate this um, one of the projects I'm going to show you um, of this character that runs around and steals things. That's why he's called Robbie, and he has a swift hand. Um, and the other studio is uh, Back to the Game. And this is a studio we worked with in creating the Lost Crypt demo that was in the keynote. And I'm going to talk a bit about more. And we will release at some point and things like this. So, um, And that's literally all my slides. So I'm, I'm now going to go to the editor. So this is a um, project uh, put together to kind of demonstrate lots of different lights and lots of different settings. And this is using the um, Universal Render Pipeline's 2D renderer. So if I now play the game, um, it's actually super basic. You just run around and collect stuff. Um, there's nothing revolutionary about that. Um, but you basically have this character called Robbie, who runs, jumps around this environment. His face is lit up when he stands next to this glowing lantern. When he stands in front of it, he gets this like weird silhouette, because it doesn't make sense to render the light in front of his face. Uh, you have these like floating orbs. Um, you also have some swinging things with uh, like some nice light, light cookies. I'll, I'll show you how the, all that works. Um, here we have like a, a nice lens, uh, a nice sorry, 
a nice light shaft coming down, which is sort of influencing the normal map. So these like spikes. I'll show you how that stuff is set up. Um, what else do we have? Oh, we had this uh, tile map wall with this like kind of weird like blue glowing emission area. That's using the masking system, and I'll, sh I'll show you this as well. Um, you basically collect these orbs. It's super basic. Uh, let's collect all the orbs and see what happens. And everyone's just, everyone's just come to a talk to watch me play a game, which is great. So yeah, and then you, basically the level has just got all these different lights and different things littered. Um, so, so one of the super cool things about this project is it's pretty much, it's all 2D, right? So if I actually fly here, none of that, well, other than some like layering of the layers to do some nice parallax, it's pretty much all entirely 2D. But you get lots of these nice depths and different definitions. So I'm going to go through a couple of these things uh, very quickly right now and explain how this was done. So we have this uh, tool in Unity called the Package Manager. So now I'm trying to connect to the internet, which is a very brave thing to do um, on conference Wi-Fi. And we have here lot, all the different packages that you can install to bring features into your project. And you don't have to get features this way. You can all, some are still embedded. Some you can just get from like GitHub and stuff. But um, with the uh, universal render pipeline or lightweight uh, render pipeline, um, you basically can just install this from here. So you just click, click the package and install it. And then once you install it, you not only get that, uh, that functionality, such as shader graph and all these different tools, um, but also the 2D renderer. So if I go to my uh, graphic settings, um, I'll get there quickly. Uh, one thing you might notice, in the top right-hand corner, we have this thing called the 2D renderer. So one thing that Universal Rem Pipeline lets you do is actually create your own custom renderers and inject them. So if you want to have a renderer that, let's say, all shadows are now red, why not? You know, uh, you can create your own kind of custom renderer extension and kind of inject them into this process. And the 2D renderer data is, or the 2D renderer part of this is actually part of that whole workflow. So once you plug that in, you then get the 2D renderer settings. Um, and once you get those, you can then have all the lights and all these different 2D renderer tools. So let's have a look at a couple of things in this, uh, in this scene. So we have here a little hanging lamp. And the hanging lamp has basically this uh, point light range. Um, I'll just remove its cookie so, you, so I can show you a bit clearly. So we've got this hanging lamp here. Um, and the hanging lamp is using a thing called a 2D point light. But 2D point light, in my opinion, is kind of like a weird way of naming it because it's not just a point light. You can use it as a spotlight. You can use it as a fill light. You can use it as a as kind of a, a cookie light and all these different things. And one thing that the team really tried to do is make the lots of different options and lots of different things you can do with this light, but also lots of different gizmos. So you probably saw um, you can basically sort of change the range of this light so you could still have it behave as a, as a point light moving around the environment. But you can also do things like specify like the range, so you could have it as a, like a kind of like a spotlight. Um, you can also do things such as fall off. So currently, it's a very hard spotlight. So if I if I click off of it, right, it's just very hard spotlight, and it's got very hard um, edges. Um, but you can also do things like feather because we're using 2D and everything is kind of being masked with the environment, or in the camera render, we can also do things such as fall off. So now we have like a nice smoother fall off around the light. And obviously, this is, a lot of this is possible because we're rendering this 2D light onto 2D sprites. Everything's flat and composited in that way. 3D is obviously very different in how fall off um, works. So we have this, uh, we have this 2D light. Um, as well as being able to do these things, we've got lots of different sliders on the side. So another thing you can do is actually the inner radius. So notice how another gizmo sort of appears. And you can basically do things like, so you don't want it to be kind of a nice linear fall off from the root of the light towards the end. You can actually do things like, you know, like a 80% fall off. So it's more of like a curve. So you get like a lot of nice little sliders and nice little things to play around with to control how uh, your, your, your point light is affecting the environment. Um, we also get some things such as um, alpha blend overlap. This is pretty cool. So if you get like multiple lights, so here we've got like a yellow point light. So if I move this off here, we have a yellow point light which is moving, which is rendering this above um, gargoyle face. So if I bring this up here, you'll notice that the lights are kind of not uh, meshing very well. But if you enable this little alpha blend on overlap, 
Notice that without it, there's kind of a light priority. The blue light is dominating this light. And often when you're creating projects with lights, uh, you're often like overlapping lots of these lights all, all these different places. But with Alpha Blend on overlap, we basically, the 2D renderer kind of takes these lights and kind of like uh, merges them. So you notice that as I bring it now, it's actually combining these colors together. So rather than it's lots of hard lights fighting each other, we get this nice mix. So we get this yellow light and the blue light working very, very nicely together. So what else should we talk about here? Um, we can do some things such as um, intensities. So obviously, you can brighten up the intensity and see how intense it is. That's cool. Um, but the other thing is uh, normal map influence. Um, so one thing you can do, well, you've been able to do for a long time is generate normal maps and assign them to things. And with the 2D renderer, um, one thing that we've wanted to do is be able to give you access to, let's find a nice thing give you access to be able to assign. So here we've got, in the far right-hand corner, uh, like a normal texture of the tarmap wall. Um, and previously, if you created normal maps using Photoshop or a normal map generator or any, any other tool um, for, for 2D sprites, 3D lights has this super weird effect where it's kind of got this weird depth and the distance doesn't really make sense. And, and the falloff just doesn't sort of fit very nicely with the normal map influence. Um, so with, 2D, with the 2D renderer, the um, shaders that come with um, the 2D renderer all have normal map influence and can be influenced by the 2D lights. So here you'll notice that I've got this, uh, if I turn off normal map in intensity, notice it's just lighting it as if it's very flat. It looks very flat. There isn't really any depth to um, the sprites. But in enabling normal map influence, it's then going to read from that um, normal map texture and you also get some controls, such as the distance of the normal map influence. So you actually get some nicer, finer controls for the 2D lights in how they influence the normal maps being applied to the sprites. So you can either use no normal maps and just have a very nice, hard, hard light, or you can have a, um, you can have a light that looks like this with a normal map influence. Uh, you also get some other fun stuff to play with. Um, this one uh, is volume uh, opacity. So this basically defines how filled this actually space the, the space is. So with zero volume opacity, it's basically just taking this point light data, creating that uh, mask and being applied to the um, uh, the sprite shader. Um, with the volume opacity, you, you can fill the space a lot more. So you notice that it's actually not only influencing normal maps and things like this, but it's basically becoming a volumetric cone. And this is a lot easier in 2D, partly because we don't have to worry about things like camera position in 3D space or um, rendering direction and depth and these things. Basically, we're basically creating this nice mask and just filling up the uh, uh, how opaque it is. Um, so you can do some really nice stuff with 2D lights in terms of uh, volumetrics. So if I place this light here, um, place another light here, you know, make this light red. You could do some really nice uh, effects. Obviously, disco mode. Um, my parents like this one. They're like, what do you do for a job? And I show them disco mode, and they're pretty happy. Uh, that's not a joke. That's actually real, real conversations I have at Christmas. Um, so yeah, you can basically take a lot of these lights and stack them on top of each other, and it's going to be very nice in how they all merge together and blend. So. Everyone's now going to make disco games, and that's, that's cool, I think. We need more disco games in, uh, in the world. So yeah, we've got this, uh, this light like this. Uh, let me just go back, because I want to show you something, something else that's uh, a lot of fun to play with. We need a mega undo button. I'll add that to the feedback doc. So um, we have this point light, and that's rendering like this. Uh, another thing you can do is actually apply cookies. And again, this is nothing new. People have been adding cookies to games for so many years, um, probably decades at this point. Um, but we can now use sprites as cookies. So if I take any sort of sprite, and I think I've got this uh, nice uh, like black and white cross influencing the area, I can then assign this. So this light has this kind of like cross area, and this cookie is being applied here, which means that now the light, when it swings, as it does in the in the in uh, okay, is this one? As the demo, the cookie light is then coming with it, um, so that's cool. You can now apply to these lights not just the shape of the point light and the cone range and things like this, but also like a nice little mask. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's a lot of fun. Um, and you can also obviously do things. So let's get the character's head, you know, 
Okay, it's upside down, but whatever. So we now have like a big uh, 2D light re using the sprite of the, of the character, and you can obviously, I'm kind of going off script, but that, that's cool. So we can now do graffiti in games and neon spotlights and stuff. I'll notice how it's all very consistent. So you can not only sculpt lights using these gizmos, but sculpt lights in Photoshop or wherever, bring it in and use it for that shape. I'm sure Pixel Rain are watching right now and didn't expect, or watching the video and didn't expect that I'd use their character's head as a light um, at some point in this demo, so that's fun. Um, if you, uh, so, so going back, on, back onto the topic of lights, um, when you install that universal render pipeline package, when you go to the light menu, you have all the, your usual fun stuff, directional light, point light, and these things. Um, but the 2D lights are all here. So you've got global light, point light, parametric light, sprite light, and freeform light. So you've got all these different lights that you can use in stack. And I've kind of covered mostly point light, but I'm going to cover a couple of other ones. The other one that's probably key to talk about is a um, global light. And if you see in the inspector in the far right-hand side, the global light's a lot simpler than that point light. It's kind of like the ambient lighting in your environment, or similar to kind of a directional light. So everything in this project is actually using the global light. So if I then increase the intensity, notice that we can actually control how sort of light and dark that sort of big, big fill light is. And it is used often as a fill light or uh, you know, as a tint. So someone shout out a color. Please don't say white, black, or pink, because those are all break my demo. Oh, great. So yeah, disco mode, right, cool. Yeah, it's, if it's not white, black, or purple, uh, or pink, they usually say purple, which is close to pink. So thank you for making this uh, monstrosity right here. So you can do some very nice tinting and very nice um, shading by using this global sort of fill light through, throughout the environment. Cool. I'm going to undo that. I'm sorry. Um, we can have a talk afterwards. Uh, yeah. So um, that's the global light. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. You just fill your light throughout the entire scene. The next one is probably my favorite light, and I'll say that quite a few times, they're all my favorite light, um, I won't lie to you, is a freeform light. So a freeform light's a bit different to a point light. A point light is specifying a source of a light, like a light bulb, like uh, this spotlight here, and then the projection from that light from the center of that point. Now a freeform light's different. You actually sculpt a specify a range for that light to fill. So in this demo, um, we've got this big light, light shaft. I wanted to kind of simulate light shafts, even though in the world there's actually no hole in the wall. Um, video game hacks, right? Um, so I basically wanted to specify this big range that the light was, was being cast in in this zone. So we have here this freeform light. And with the freeform light, there's a lot of similar settings that you have with the point light. But this time, you can actually sculpt, similar to how you do like sprite shape, kind of the area that this, uh, that this uh, freeform light takes. So you can actually specify some kind of shape. Um, I'm not going to try sculpting Copenhagen. Uh, but you can see here how easy it is. You can actually just grab and add points. And notice how it's actually just filling all the, all the environment. It's just such a nice, pleasing tool to, to play with and specify, you know, there you go. My level design is now like, what the hell were you thinking when you created this? Um, make it more like a light shaft piece. Um, but now, now that we have this freeform light, and you can kind of sculpt light in different ways, you can control things like how much the fall off is. So if I wanted a very tight freeform light, look, we literally just sculpted like, like this. I'm no artist, but this is my art, right? So in, in game jams, people look at my monstrosities and think, what the heck are you thinking? Um, but we can specify like a nice fall off from this outside area, and also control things like how smooth that fall off is. Um, if it does the blending stuff, the intensity, uh, the normal map influence as well. You basically get a lot of the similar controls that you had before with the point light, but also with the freeform light, which is specifying a nice big area. Um, and again, these also like stack. So if I make this like, you know, really demonic uh, uh, freeform light and then sort of make another one down here, it's a lot of fun to be able to just play around with how this light fills this space. Uh, let's make, uh, I'm not going to crowd, actually no, purple guy is really sad. Um, you can have your purple light back. So you can notice how you can sort of sculpt and, and overlap the lights and they all additively blend nicely together. So again, people are going to make nice disco uh, video games with using this stuff. That's a lot of fun. So yeah, we've got a nice big uh, light shaft that looks like that.
So that's a freeform light. That's great. So I've been through a couple so far. I've been through global light. I've been through point light. I've been through freeform light. And the next one I want to talk about is sprite light. So a sprite light is actually used for this um, kind of glowing area around here. So if I now select um, the sprite light, I'll show you what it's actually doing. So this is basically a sprite light. It's taking a sprite shape, and it's different to a cookie. So what the cookie is doing is the cookie is taking the, the range of the point light, and then it's kind of then masking kind of where the light shouldn't be. What sprite light is doing is without this, uh, without this range, uh, without the sprite, uh, basically, it's then saying, oh, here is where the sprite light should be. So it's kind of, I guess, similar to like, uh, like a projector projecting out onto a screen a shape or something. So if I go to one of my, uh, you know, so we now got uh, this, uh, this little head here, and then we now got this nice big uh, blown up uh, head. We then get all the similar controls, you know, the intensity, whether it influences normal maps and things like this, the volume opacity. So you can actually sculpt a lot of lights using uh, sprites and then assign them. So it kind of goes nicely with the cookie where it's kind of removing light and this is then adding light in that particular shape. So you can kind of use a lot of these uh, pretty cool things together. And this project has all sorts of different things, like the floor is using normal maps, so it's getting this freeform light. There's lots of different parts. And this project's not available yet. Um, I need to tidy it up, and then I'm going to release it and, and write information. I kind of don't believe in releasing a project that's messy, so I want to tidy it up um, and then release it, and then people will be able to see how these things were done with this, uh, with this project. So uh, moving on to more stuff, uh, next one is uh, Shader Graph. Um, so one thing you'll notice here is the background of um, this tarmap wall, because this was painted using the tarmap system, it has this weird blue glowing kind of like weird uh, neon sort of effect. And what you might notice in some parts is it's not affecting all parts of this tarmap wall. It's only affecting uh, just the little grooves. It's not taking you know, all, all the in individual parts. It's only these kind of grooves that are basically having this blue um, glowing influence. And this is done using Shader Graph, but also using that mask map system. So if I now select this tarmap wall and have a look at the shader here on the far right-hand side, you'll notice that there's two uh, texture properties. One is for the normal maps, and one is a thing called a mask texture, which I'll get onto in a second. Another one is a bunch of different fun tools and properties that I've exposed. Because uh, when I had to take screenshots, uh, the marketing web people like, oh, we want it more like uh, faster. We want it more glowy and uh, you know, like uh, asking me for lots of changes. So I said, hey, I'll just expose a bunch of values and you can take the screenshots and then I can go uh, do, some, do some other things. But um, so basically, you know, uh, obviously use it, using this exposed properties, we could control various things like the glow influence, you know, how bright these are, because all of this is using Bloom as well. OK, that's a little too much. Um, you know, the size of the cells, so we can make it sort of a bit more glitchy, which is kind of fun. Um, you know, scrolling faster, shuffle speed. We get lots of fun controls that we can expose. Um, so if I now open this shader, let's have a look at, to see how it was put together. So here, we're basically constructed the whole shader using this tool called Shader Graph. And I won't spend too much time on exactly how Shader Graph works and the node creation process, because we've got like loads of examples and videos and stuff already online. Um, I want to just focus. So if you're watching the video, pause right now, watch those, and then uh, resume uh, at this exact point. Obviously, people in the crowd don't have the luxury of doing this um, right now. Uh, but I want to just cover like this sort of sprite part. So. Uh, this is quite a simple shader sort of put together. So one is how it scrolls using time. So it's taking the UV of the tarmap wall, and it's scrolling it in, in a direction. Um, then here, there is basically an element of Verano noise, which is taking that scroll. And then it's then basically been tinted blue. Um, it doesn't have to be blue. It could be red. It could be green. It could be in any of these colors. But uh, blue is a nice neon glow color, I think. And then if we then move up here and move over to this um, end master node, this is basically the output of the shader graph. So all the shaders and shader graph and most shader based in, uh, interfaces generally flow all their data from, from left to right. And right, the far right being the output of that end shader. This, is what act, this, uh, this one here is what actually then generates that output shader that is then used. So if I look at it, it's actually called sprite lit master. 
we've added two new master nodes. If you've used Shader Graph before, there wasn't a Sprite Lit Master, but now we've added uh, Sprite Lit Master and Sprite Unlit Master as well. So if I go to the um, go to the the, uh, the the node creation menu and go to Master here, um, I have Universal Render Pipeline installed. So we've got PBR, which is for like three D physically based rendering um, uh, shaders, Unlit for Unlit stuff, and Visual Effect, which I've never used, so I can't really talk about that. I don't know what it does. Um, but we've now got these two, Sprite Lit and Sprite Unlit. And these are kind of self-expansory. Sprite Unlit, which if I create, will basically output your end result of your shader into a vertex position, vertex normal, vertex tangent, and also a color. So if you, just, if you don't care about 2D lights, and this whole time you've been asleep and you're like, whatever, lighting's overrated, I want to do lots of unlit stuff, Cuphead did pretty well, uh, you know, very well. Uh, you know, then that, but you get to this part, then you think, cool, I can now output just the end color value. So we've then got that uh, color value for those uh, people. But if you're really into the 2D light stuff and you want to make some nice 2D lit games, we still have the same vertex position, vertex normal, and vertex tangent outputs, but we also have color. That's kind of like the, the, the base sprite value, mask, which I'll talk about in a bit, and normal map. So you can then output slightly more data to be hooked into the 2D lighting system. Normal map's kind of self-explanatory. It's a normal map, and you output the normal map to be influenced by the 2D lights. Color is a little bit more interesting. So here it's being applied to the tar map wall, and you'll notice that it's taking all the different tiles from that tar map sheet that's been painted onto the wall. And if I look in this little blackboard at the top here, we've got here this reference called underscore main text. And this is the reference that the shader graph is listening out for. And if you call your references underscore main text, it's then going to grab the sprite renderer's sprite or the tar maps renderer. And then that way, you can basically reference anything being animated and set in that, um, in that value. So um, for example, this tar map wall has a bunch of tiles painted onto it. And then rather than me having to say, oh, these are all the tiles and assign them, basically, using underscore main text, it instantly grabs that data that's being rendered to the tar map renderer or sprite renderer and being applied directly into the shader graph. So we're getting that data automatically, which means that this background glow effect I can apply to any tarmac renderer and any sprite renderer. And it's going to have basically the same result without having me to specify some more settings. So it kind of grabs that data. That data is kind of separate from shader graph, and it pulls it from that component, which is pretty cool. You can make reusable uh, uh, shaders and stuff. And I'll show you some examples in a little bit. Um, now let's talk about mask stuff. So the mask color, the mask output, has a value of 4, so RGBA. And with the 2D system, you basically get control over the a global control over these mask outputs. And what is going to be ideal in handling this whole process is to kind of define on which channel, which of these channels controls different things. So in PBR, you have like one channel for metallic, one channel for smoothness, one channel for for ambient occlusion and one channel for emission and stuff like this. And in the 2D render, you could be more flexible. You can say, oh, the red channel is for silhouette, and then the green channel is for emission, and the blue channel is for Fresnel and stuff like this. Um, so if I now select the 2D renderer, uh, which you'll see in the top right-hand corner, all the way at the top, I'm happy I've got a really big screen because it's really embarrassing when it's small and I have to point to a tiny thing on the screen. Uh, we've got these different light blend styles. So we've got default, which is basically just rendering all the sprites as is. Um, that's just normal. And then it's rendering with a multiply blend mode and things like this. And then I have two extra um, light blend styles. So here we've got silhouette layer for when the character walks in front of the um, light. And that's on the red channel. So anything with the red channel will use the data from this silhouette layer. The green channel is using an emission glow layer. So it's everything it output through this green channel in shader graph, or the green channel in the mask map is going to use this emission glow. So if we have a look here, let's go to this uh, mask map. Well, you'll notice that we have this little mask map texture that looks like this. Um, let's have a look at it. It's uh, So one thing you'll notice here is we have this mask map texture, which I uh, painted. I did say I wasn't an artist, so, but it's pretty simple to, to color inside the lines. And what it's doing is it's basically kind of creating a pre-baked mask or a 
created a pre-baked mask, and this is what that glow layer is then going to use. So you can, like PBR workflows, you can color in. Red channel here is for Nell, green channel here is for emission, blue channel here is for uh, whatever you want. You can be very flexible and dynamic. <coughs> Sorry. There was a lot of talking in the keynote rehearsals. Um, so basically, with that mask map, you can define the area that that light is, uh, is influencing. So if I come back to here, have a look at this glow map, it's using that mask channel and kind of taking it and then isolating it to a particular light layer. So if I now go to the, um, this, uh, this light, so this is a global light called a glow layer um, light. Notice that it has a different blend style. So rather than default, so rather than its default affecting everything, it's actually saying, hey, go to the green channel of everything using that mask output through Shadograph or uh, through Shadograph, and then affect it. So that means that I can then set up lights to influence specific layers. And I'll show you the Lost Crypt demo in a second. It uses this heavily. So here I've got this light that's only effect that I can change. I can tweak. Does someone shout out a color, not purple? Thank you. Thank you for a normal suggestion. That's great. Um, so we have here now this global light affecting this mask map here. And of course, you could do things like make extra lights. So if I take a um, point light, so we've got a point light like so. Uh, let's put point light here. Um, we can um, tell it which layer to render onto. That's one thing I actually forgot about. So the 2D light system is actually ingrained heavily into sorting layers. So you made a 2D game, and you often have sorting layers of like background layer, foreground layer, detail layer, whatever. Um, the 2D lighting system actually allows you to render specific lights to specific layers. So if you have a background, you could say, this background is affected by this global light and some point lights for stars or whatever, or the moon or the sun. Then you have the, the player light, and you have like, oh, I have a spotlight just on the player, not the background. You can actually isolate lights per layers, which is super cool. So if I say that this point light affects all layers, let's move to somewhere where I can't actually see anything. So notice it's actually affecting all layers. Let's increase the intensity. So you've got this nice little point light that's actually moving around in the scene. But I don't want it to render to all layers. I want it to just render to that green channel and influence this. I can then change it to green channel. What you'll now notice is it is not doing it. Less. Oh, it is, it is kind of doing it, actually. So notice that it's now like a much brighter spot around here when it's being influenced by that shader graph. So you can actually do things like mix shader graph with the global light, with mask layer, and you can kind of stack a lot of these things down um, into place. Um, so I actually pre-prepared one here, just in case that didn't work. But it worked, so that's cool. So we've got here this little, uh, this little totem. And this little totem, or this pedestal, is actually pretty simple. It's got a normal map. And you can notice the normal map fall off from here. It has a mask, um, mask texture set up. And notice that as I bring the light forward, it's actually isolating this nice big glowing light. So you could do some really cool effects, like mask out certain areas that are affected by um, certain lights. So you can like have some super nice glowing, if I influence this. Notice that it's got a very nice sort of like glowing part for certain parts of this totem. So if I now actually select this pedestal and have a look at its textures, so we've got its, uh, we've got its default texture that looks like this. We've got its normal map texture. And then we have its mask texture, which notice in the green channel, which is the one using that emission map. Sorry, it's really small. Um, it's using that for the emission mask. So. Um, I know it's like a lot to wrap your head around and things, but once you start playing around with these mask maps and start isolating colors to certain channels, you can do some really, really cool, powerful things. Um, one thing I wasn't actually going to talk about, but I'll talk about it now, is these little uh, glowing particles in the air. Oh, notice actually this red light's now influencing the, um, the uh, mask channel here. Um, so these little particles in the air are using shader graph, oh, and Robbie as well. That's actually kind of cool. I didn't know it would do that. So you must have a mask channel. Yeah, you could do, like, I didn't even realize this. We should, just, we should just have fun and just mess around with lights. This is, this is super cool. Do some cool scanning stuff. Yeah. Um, so these, these little particles in the air are also using Shadergraph. 
So these, they're using shadowgraph as well. So notice as I'm bringing this red light around here, it's actually glowing all these like little dust particles. So you can combine particles with lights with shadowgraph and do some really nice combined effects. What else does this light of influence? This is actually curious. I, I didn't know to do this. I did pre-plan some stuff, but this is, this is I'm going way off track now. Um, so yeah, you could say, oh, the Unity logo. Uh, I haven't cleared this with branding, but it should be okay. Um, Unity logo is like more red in this effect. So now it's scrolling green, but then it's red in this hot spot area here. So you can really layer up different things and have some really nice influences and effects. So this is this project. I mean, I butchered it a little bit. And I mean, the art directors can be really, really annoyed at me for such a horrible clashing of colors. Um, so this, this, there's this project. I need to tidy this up um, and then like release it so then people can play around with it and stuff. So I want to now jump to another project. Uh, this is very brief. <laughs> so I want to jump to another project, which is the one... Uh, who was in the keynote yesterday? Oh, sorry. Okay, cool. So I'm going to jump to that project now, which we actually have out on the booth, um, if you want to go play around with it and see how stuff's made, and show you a couple of really cool things that are in, in uh, this demo, because uh, this demo has a lot more to it. Um, and I should have preloaded this. Whilst it's preloading it, let's have some more fun with, the, with this light. So yeah, we got this uh, pretty cool point light here. We could uh, specify sort of a nice range. We could, uh, yeah, you can do some really nice, cool effects. I'm sure some of you are already like, yeah, I'm going to make a predator scanner and you know, all this type of stuff. Um, yeah. Actually, I'll show you a, a really fun thing. So uh, this character uh, called Robbie. So you notice he's being influenced by all these lights and stuff. Um, so he actually has this. Uh, he has this little silhouette. Let me let me just behead him. Um, oh, I can't behead him. Okay. 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 Let's go into play mode. <laughs> Please go into play mode. That would be wonderful. Uh, no. Okay. Oh, the red light's still down there. Okay, so notice that he actually walks in front of the silhouette. And originally, this light rendered in front of his face, which doesn't make any sense, right? The lights, but if the light's behind me, it shouldn't light here, right? It should be, you know, silhouetted. So notice he's got like this very faint little silhouette. And this is actually done. If I actually go to this, uh, go to this, uh, this uh, funny character, um, this is actually done by creating a little silhouette texture. So notice how there's like a very fine, it's kind of tricky to see, a little fine black line around the outside edge in the red channel. And the light here, the little silhouette point light here, um, which, let me just select it properly. That would be great. So I've got the, like, this little range inside here, and this is on the red layer. So what this is doing is it's going to the red channel of all masks and saying, okay, now use the data set in the 2D renderer data for here. If I go here, what you'll notice is that the silhouette layer, and I'll close the other one so you can see, silhouette layer is affecting the red channel, but it's subtractive. It's actually removing the light or removing the value before. So rather than being additive and making things glow, it's actually removing it. So when he walks in front of it, it's actually removing that front light. So rather than turning on and off the light, it's actually just removing it and subtracting it. So you can do some nice subtracting. People can make all sorts of weird games, which is cool. Weird games are, weird games are more fun. But it was like a weird trick. Every time people were testing this in the office and he was running from the light, they were like, that just looks wrong and broke the whole demo. So then I had to kind of work out the subtractive stuff. So if you're having characters running in front of lights, this is kind of one way to do it. So let's have a look at uh, this project. So this is um, the Lost Crypt demo, which you saw in the keynote. It's a, a simple platformer. You run one way, um, pick up a thing, and you run left. It's, uh, but there's lots of really nice, beautiful things that are in play in this demo. And one of them is uh, 2D shadows. So what you see here in this filled area is this is actually a big uh, kind of uh, sprite light or freeform light, which is coming down uh, from this part. So this, this demo is pretty cool because it's actually littered with all these little 2D lights. So if I actually thicken this up a bit and select one of these. Ooh. I can select stuff eventually. 
Okay, let's uh, let's ignore that for the time being. So if I go if I go to the uh, if I go to the character, oh my whole editor layout's messed up. That's great. Very embarrassing. I'm sorry. So if we go to the character, the character actually occludes the um, shadow. So if I take her along here. So what, one thing you'll notice is that as she walks here, there's a very faint little shadow. There's a reason why it's faint, because we only support hard shadows currently um, instead of soft shadows. But basically, the character herself has a um, composite shadow caster. So this is a little component that you can add. And what it will do is it will actually take um, the various shapes on the character and sort of sculpt a shadow, uh, shadow mask or like a shadow... Um, a shadow, a shadow, basically, yeah, a shadow caster. It, it creates a shape that the shadow system then kind of ignores and things like this. So if I now select the uh, the lights, uh, of which we have, oh my gosh, we have so many. Which one was it? Okay, it's one of these. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll get there eventually. <laughs> Uh, it's the last one, of course, yeah. So if I go to this very last light, what you'll notice is that there's some extra shadow settings here. We have shadow intensity and shadow volume. So if I now like increase the shadow intensity and increase the shadow volume, uh, it obviously doesn't do anything, right? Okay, let's increase this. So one thing you'll notice now is that because that shadow caster component's there, and the light direction, the light position is up here, she's actually casting this light a bit more and sort of creating this shadow. So. If I now like rotate her, I know this is very weird, but it's now like as her body moves around, it's then uh, not casting light from that point. So the shadow casting system is very powerful in that you kind of add these little shadow caster components, whether it's the composite or uh, the other shadow caster component, which has uh, got finer details, it then occludes that shadow light, uh, that occludes that light from that direction. So you can do some nice stuff with 2D shadows, 2D lights, shader graph, and all these. Uh, different parts here. Um, there's, another, there's lots of really other cool stuff to play around with here. So, so we got this, uh, this water, which is actually reflecting a lot of the environment. If I now select this, uh, if I actually grab this, uh, this light um, and basically do what a, uh, come on. I have used Unity maybe once. OK, whatever. Let's just grab it. So as I move this, uh, so I move this light. It's actually kind of like subtly reflecting in the water, and this was achieved by basically having like a secondary camera render this environment, and then in Shader Graph, then like flipping it down. So um, if we go to the water material, let's open this up. The water material basically feeds in that render texture from the camera. Uh, as you can see here, so if I open up this blackboard and go down a little bit um, to uh, go to here. Yeah, mirror render texture. So this is rendered from that second camera capturing the screen. And then it's passed in here. And then using Shader Graph, it, it doesn't look like much here. But using Shader Graph, you can then apply some logic or apply some data to this. So it's rendering that kind of section of the screen. And then we're then applying you know, the ripples. Uh, we're applying the, the cow sticks. Uh, we're applying a whole bunch of different things that are then being applied to um, this, uh, this water area here. And uh, they're, about to, uh, they're about to evict me. But I want to show you one more thing, if that's OK. Thank you. Sorry. So these are trees. These all move with Shader Graph. So it actually has a Shader Graph sine wave moving backwards and forwards. And these tree, bu these tree bushes actually have a uh, mask channel. So if I find this uh, mask channel, so they look like this. Um, but if I open up their shader graph, they have a mask channel to define a Fresnel around the outside edge, which looks like uh, this. It doesn't look very pretty. But what you can see here in the split is we have this little uh, white edge around the outside edge. And we've got some sort of harsher colors in the top, which means light is more influencing these sort of parts here. And look, it's output through the mask map. So if I now take this, uh, I just created a, a point light here. Let's render it onto um, all layers. So we've got this point light. So notice that as I move the point light round, it's just influencing everything, right? It's not, you know, it's, it's influencing everything. It's just a hot spotlight. However, if I then put this onto the direct light layer, 
Notice as I move it around, it's not, it's only, it's not affecting the underlight as such, but it's affecting the tops of the trees. So you can actually do some really nice Fresnel effects around the edges of different parts. So we can have some really nice sort of fill lights and, and isolate certain areas. So notice the shadowy part there is not being influenced by this uh, light. And uh, this project we need to tidy up, and then after we tidy up, we're going to like release it and then write information and tutorials and, and all this stuff so people can sort of learn a lot more on how lots of different parts of this project were uh, put together. So uh, I'm one minute over, uh, which is uh, great. Um, that was just a small like little uh, run through of all lots of different things. Hopefully it was helpful, maybe, possibly. Maybe. Uh, uh. Thank you.